Our next speaker is Jinmin Liu from Stony Brook University. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I really appreciate the organizers giving me this uh, opportunity to talk about our high throughput protein protein interaction sequencing platform, ISIC. Uh, protein interactions are very important for many biological functions. They can help organize and insulate signaling pathways, and they can also mediate and regulate chemical reactions. Uh, and also, they can help form larger molecular machines to mediate various cellular activities. Therefore, a large number of protein uh, studies have been focused on the identifying protein-protein interactions in different species. And a large number of protein-protein interactions have been uh, identified, and the corresponding protein interaction networks have been constructed in those species. However, all of those studies only capture the absence of the uh, presence of the PPIs in one environment. It's possible that in different environments, some protein-protein interactions may come out. And even for those known protein-protein interactions, they may change in a different environment. So it means that we still miss some information in terms of protein-protein interactions. Uh, so from that, we, we propose to study the protein interactome dynamics across different environments. Uh, to start this project, we needed to overcome several uh, challenges. The first challenge is how to quantify the protein-protein interactions. There are three main traditional methods to study the protein interactions. The yeast to hybrid system, the mass spectrometry pull-down assay, and also the protein fragment complementary assay, PC assay. But all of those assays aimed to set up a threshold to identify which proteins interact with which proteins. In other words, they're trying to identify protein interactions, but not quantify their abundance. And the second challenge is a higher throughput is needed. Uh, let's take a Saccharomyces cerevisiae, for example. Uh, if we want to cover the protein interactome in the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, we have two assays. 18 million possible protein interactions. But if you want to study the different environments, we have to repeat asking those 18 million protein interactions in different environments, which will cost a lot of money, time, and also effort. Um, so here we propose to combine the PC assay with the newly developed technologies to overcome those two uh, challenges. Why we choose the PC assay? Uh, PCIC has a similar principle with the yeast 2 hybrid system, but instead of two domains or transcription factor, uh, it fuels the batch or pre-genes with the uh, fragments of report gene. Here we use the MDHFR, which can give the cells resistance uh, to the methotrexate. And this assay can detect the protein-protein interactions in a physiological setting because we always fuse the fragments with the batch or pre-genes in the genome. Therefore, those, pre those beta or pregenes will be expressed at their endogenous level and function in their cell natural complements. And our study have, been used, have used this method to identify a Saccharomyces cerevisiae protein interactome. So our idea is that we combine those assay with the DNA barcoding technologies so that we can use the DNA barcodes to tag each protein-protein interactions. And once we can do that, we can pull all the PPIs together, and then we can uh, track their changes simultaneously. So here is our idea. We basically use one barcode to tag the batch of the pregenes, and in the deep load cells, we use double barcodes to tag the PPI, right? But there's a, comp there's a problem, because if the double barcodes were located in different locations, once we break the cells, it will, uh, we will lose the co uh, association between those double barcodes. In other words, we cannot tell which double barcodes from the same cell. So on top of this technology, we add one extra step. We basically translocate those double barcodes onto the same locus on the same genome. And that will let us maintain the association between those double barcodes in the following steps. So here is the detailed protocol. We uh, first uh, uh, use the homologous recombination to insert those barcodes into the uh, yeast cells, and we use the sequencing to identify each barcode in the colony. And once we build those barcode strings, 
we will meet the barcode string with the PCE string one by one so that we know which barcode tag which PCE. And then we produce the diploid cells. Uh, we induce the spiralization and select for the haploid barcode strings. Once we got those haploid barcode strings, we will pull them together. And then we meet those two pools. We induce the LOXP recombination in those diploid cells. Because we include the LOXP site next to those buckers, and the LOXP recombination will put those double buckers uh, together, and also the two fragments of Euro 3 together. And the artificial intron between uh, the buckers will help us to express a complete Euro 3, and uh, which can act as a selection marker for the double buckered string. To test our idea, we did a pilot study. And in this pilot study, we uh, covered 100 protein print interactions. Of course, there are some positive and some negative protein print interactions. And we use five barcodes to tag each PC string so that there will be double, 25 double barcodes to tag each protein print interactions. Once we build this library, we grow them, uh, we do the serial batch transfer. Basically, we grow them for three generations in each flask and we transfer them into another flask. And we keep doing that to grow them for 12 generations. And at each, at every three generations, we sequence the buckers so that we can get the double buckers of frequency at each time point. Based on those data, we can estimate the fitness for each uh, lineage. And the fitness stands for the number of the complete MDHFR in the cell. And the fitness uh, basically measures the number of the protein interactions in the cell. And here is the cartoon data. And here is the real data. So without a math track seat, all the cell lineages have a similar fitness. So therefore, um, the frequency over time will be flat. But with math track seat, we can see uh, a large number of double barcodes, uh, of their frequency increase uh, incidentally, and some double barcode frequency will decrease. And based on this data, we, we develop a model to use the maximum uh, likelihood method to measure the fitness for each lineage. And we did the simulation and also the experiments. And based on those data, it shows a very high accuracy uh, for us uh, to measure the fitness. And also shows a very high reproducibility for two replicas. So then we want to, tack, we want to detect the positive protein print interactions in those 100 protein print interactions. And we compare our results with other studies. Uh, the scatter plot shows the, our results. So the x-axis is 100 protein print interactions, and the y-axis is the relative fitness compared with the negative control in our pool. And for each protein protein uh, interaction, we have three replicates. And each replicate, we have 25 double barcodes. So therefore, we have 75 replicates for each protein print interactions, and we have two different environments. So uh, based, based on this data, we uh, can detect the most uh, reported protein print interactions. And on top of that, we can detect uh, extra positive protein print interaction. And we, we validated that it's a real positive protein print interaction. And in the following study, we show that this protein print interaction is also a dynamic protein print interaction, which further supports we find a new positive protein print interaction. And once we build this library, it's very easy for us to grow them in different environments. We did that. And we did grow them in four environments. And we found those dynamic protein interactions compared with the normal environment, the DMSO environment. And the green stands for the decreasing protein interaction. And the purple stands for the increase in protein interaction. And we constructed the protein interaction network. The each circle stands for each protein, and the lines between the circles stands for the protein interaction. And the thickness stands for the protein-protein interaction score. And uh, in, 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 uh, in those, most of those dynamic protein interactions are supported by other studies. And here I show you the true positive protein interaction that we've identified in the normal environment, the FTR1 and the PDR5. Is, is increasing in the corporate environment. And actually, other studies already uh, showed us that in the corporate environment, the FTR1 MRN level was increased. So basically, our dynamic protein interactions are real. So 
then we did the validation for, for those dynamic protein interactions, and we used two independent uh, methods to, to do that, and most of the protein protein interactions uh, can be validated in one of the experiments. So then next we want to ask the, to test the scalability of our platform. So the limiting step for us to construct this library is the meeting efficiency and the log superior combination efficiency. We did the experiment and to mirror those two parameters. And based on those two parameters, we estimate for one meeting plate, we can generate 10 to 9 double markers. It means that we, if we do 100 meeting plates, we will generate 10 to 9 double markers, which can easily cover the, even the human protein interactor. So now we can generate a large number of double buckers, but then we want to ask if we can use the high sequencing, the sequencing data to add it to measure the fitness for each protein, for each double buckler. To answer that question, we need to know the distribution of the buckler frequency uh, in, in different time points, especially for the initial double buckler library. And we did that. We did a pairwise meeting to generate 2,500 double buckers, and we did the bulk meeting to generate one million double buckers. And here it shows the distribution. And this date, in both data, uh, we at the reads depth of 70 double buckler, uh, 70 reads per double buckler, we can cover 98% of the double buckers. And 95% of double buckers has more than 10 reads. And based on those data, we are confident that if we increase the reads depth to 200 reads per buckler, we can accurately estimate the fitness for each uh, double buckler. And you may ask what about the remaining 5% of the double buckers? Remember that we always include several replicas for those uh, for in our platform. Basically, we use several double buckers to tag the same protein-protein pair. It means that, and it very unlikely that we will miss all the double buckers that tag the same protein-protein pair. So we are confident that we will check all the PPIs. So in summary, our platform has the potential to measure millions of protein-protein interactions simultaneously. And also our platform can detect the dynamic protein interactions. And also our platform is highly scalable and capable of generating greater than more than 10 to 9 double buckers. And currently we are building, uh, we are buckling all the positive, uh, we are, bu are buckling the PC strings that involved all the positive PPIs. And also the ISIC is also potentially useful for many applications. I hope you guys see the posters in our lab, but it's finished. And basically, uh, Shannon and Fang Fei use those similar technologies to ask some interesting questions in the evolution. And also, we collaborate with other labs to combine the double buckling technologies with the CRISPR to study the uh, gene interactions in yeast and also in the cancer cells. So I think maybe you guys have more, I have some brilliant ideas, and uh, please feel free to talk to us. And with that, I want to thank uh, my advisor, Sasha Lewy, who always has some brilliant ideas, and also some, uh, uh, all the lab members uh, in Sasha Lewy's lab. And also, we want to thank the collaborators in Stanford, the Ronald Davis group. And with that, I take any questions. Thank you. Very, Mike, very, very nice. Do you have a sense of what fraction of these interactions are condition specific? Um, I'm sure it's threshold dependent, but you know, is it 10% of the interactions are condition specific? Is it 90%? Uh, we didn't uh, estimate that the ratio, but because we did a very small uh, protein reaction set, but uh, I didn't have that number. But in the larger scale, we definitely will uh, look at that number. It's beautiful work. Um, so ultimately, you want to measure the probability of two proteins interacting, but you're measuring fitness. So do, yeah. you, do you have a sense of the dynamical relationship between the the protein-protein interaction to the, the availability of the enzyme to fitness, so that you can back calculate the actual uh, probability of interaction? Yeah, I think basically we measure the fitness, but it's uh, 
it not, it's not the protein interaction strength, right? It includes three information, I would say. Uh, the first one is the expression level of two partner proteins. The second is the binding efficiency for those two proteins. And the third would be the localization of those two proteins. So we detect the three, the, 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 the combining result of those three informations. And we already have the idea to, to get the protein level of the two partners. So basically, we will combine our double barcoding technologies with the GFP expression at the library. So basically, the idea, we use the facts to, uh, to sort the strains that have different uh, protein levels. And then we use the double barcode to tag to find the, which proteins uh, in different abundance. So yeah. All right, thank you.